Hey everybody, it's the Trout, and welcome to another episode of the Trout Show. Thank you so much for stopping by. You know, when I think about our 50th state of Hawaii, I think about how beautiful it is. I've had been fortunate to be gone there several times. You know, the warm sandy beaches, the waves, the Pacific breeze coming off the ocean, the palm trees swaying in the air, eating some of that great Hawaiian food, and of course, watching ladies do the hula. All of that I think about when I think about Hawaii. What I don't think about is, gee, I'd like to move to Hawaii and become a musician. But the story today is about just a gentleman that just did that and now has become a successful musician on Hawaii. His name is Matt Krahula. Matt was doing very well in New York State. He has a degree in upright bass, but he decided, you know what, I don't like where I am. I need to move someplace else, and he chose Oahu. Now, you may think that's crazy, but believe it or not, in only less than a week, he got his first gig as a musician in Hawaii, and ever since then, he's been successfully doing that. And that's his story, talking about how he got there, how he works with some of the most famous musicians in Hawaii, how he's established himself as an Hawaiian musician, but also a new album that he's coming out with that he worked with, collaborated with people back in New York State. So if you want to hear about Hawaii, which I like talking about, and a great story, an interesting story about a musician taking a chance on his career, then you'll want to stay tuned. That's next on The Trout Show. Matt Krahula, musician in Hawaii. I'm going to start with something simple. Sure. When did you go from New York to Oahu? How long have you been in Hawaii? Uh, I've been here for about six years. Um, so 2018, uh, I got here in October of 2018. So you grew up, uh, you were in New York City, where did you grow up? Where, in this... uh, so I was living in the Bronx before I moved oh. here, but I grew up in Albany, New York. So oh, okay, upstate, upstate. Yeah. where it's not crazy. <laughs> it's pretty, well, it's a little quieter up there. And I spent a lot of time in the, uh, between Albany and also the Adirondacks. I was going to say Adirondacks, uh, I bet you've been there. You also, I see it's behind you. You got a degree in what you learned how to play, which is the upright bass, which is two of them standing right behind you. You have a bachelor's, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. I do, yeah. I have a bachelor's in fine arts from uh, the Purchase Conservatory. I studied uh, classical music there with um, Timothy Cobb, who's the principal bass player of the New York Philharmonic now. Mm. Um, when I studied with him, he was principal of the uh, Metropolitan Opera yeah. back then. So he's so you he's were kind of, classically trained. Which I you was, mean, yeah. You, you know those things called notes on a page. I do. Yeah, <laughs> I can read and sight read and all that stuff. Excuse me, uh, I hate your guts. I hate your guts. Uh, anyway, because I've always been, I can, but it's like, give me in one page and three hours from now, I'll tell you what it is. I always thought I would go to Boston University, actually. I really wanted to go there. And the... The person, one of the teachers there, you know, if you if you studied there, you studied with people from the from the Boston Symphony, mm. and um, I uh, is that the John Williams know, Symphony? That's the one he performed at. Was that John Williams deal? I believe so, but yeah, I mean, he's uh, not the leader. Me. I mean, obviously, John Williams is like ninety years old or something like that. But yeah, I think that's <laughs> the Boston Pops. He used to talk about that years ago. The Boston Pops. So I uh, I really wanted to go there and. They only had one um, opening the year that I was applying, and the uh, administrative office told me there was 120 base applicants applying. So uh, you know, for one opening for one opening. So I said, "Well, I'll give it a shot anyway." And um, I ended up. Uh, I, I took a lesson with one of the teachers beforehand. And um, I said, you know, these are the pieces that I've been preparing. What do you think they're going to want to hear at the audition? And he said, well, don't like, don't do any, don't do the Bach cello suites. Everybody's going to come in and do Bach. So you have like a lot of nice repertoire here. Do, do one of those pieces. So I really focused on everything but Bach leading up to it. And when I got there, I was on the stage at Boston University and the, in the bass section from uh, the Boston Symphony was sitting in front of me and they the guy that told me not to learn Bach said, um, 
We'd like to hear one of the Bach cello suites. I knew and, it was um, coming. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, yeah. All right. And so I went for it. And um, I ended up getting accepted. Uh, they only had one spot. Uh, and I, I guess if they were ranking people, I, I finished second place. Mm. So, but they, they ended up, they offered me a spot there and, and offered to hire another teacher if I wanted to come there, oh. uh, that would start her own studio there. But, uh, wow. I ended up, I ended up going a different direction and, and, uh, you know, the, the teacher at, at Purchase College was, uh, was also from my hometown and he called my house and, and talked to me about like what the experience would be at Purchase and it just sounded really great. Mm -hmm. So he, I was, he swayed me in that direction and it was a great experience. I'm really glad I ended up with that decision. Were you a classic fan when you were young? You know, you know I never, I was never the person that was sitting at home and listening to classical music, which probably held me back a little bit as far as uh, some of the finer points of that style. But yeah. uh, I'm, I really enjoyed uh, the challenge of learning like difficult music um, and, and getting better at the excerpts and the, and the etudes and the, practice pieces and just like the drills I like really enjoyed that portion and then I also just actually playing and I played in a um a youth orchestra throughout high school mm. and uh, just like being in the middle of all that sound I really enjoyed that too uh, yeah it's but I, I got exposed to it when I was a kid it was in the town I grew up in they took us to the symphony a couple of times so, I mean, I learned all that stuff. Do not clap until he turns around. You know, <laughs> we're like, okay, hold on. Okay, now you can do it. Uh, the majority of people don't know anything about that. You know, the first violinist and all that stuff, I learned about it. Sure. Um, but what was the thing that said, you know, I want to play an instrument that I can't carry around with me except like another dead body. So... <laughs> I mean, what was the thing that said, ooh, I like, I mean, other than, I understand why to a certain degree because of the sound and the bass and all that stuff, but what, what said, ooh, I want to play upright bass? So I started in fourth grade um, and through public school. And there was a really, really good teacher in our school. His name was Nat Fosner. And um, I don't really remember exactly how it happened because I was kind of, I was young. Yeah. Uh, but I remember he brought all the instruments except for an upright bass in and all the kids were trying the different instruments. And at one point he said to me, he thought he'd be, I'd be a good candidate for upright bass, probably because he needed one to fill out the orchestra <laughs> for that grade and nobody was yeah. picking it. So yeah. I, some, for some reason I went home, like really amped up about the upright bass and told my parents, that's what I would like to play. And I, they said, oh, you know, like maybe like a little smaller, maybe a cello or like, you know, uh, but they're always so supportive. So I told them I really wanted to play upright bass and they, they talked to the teacher about it. And that I just ended up going down that path. My dad ended up, uh, you know, car choices changed moving forward. It was always a car that could fit, fit the upright bass from <laughs> that point that. Yeah. on and, uh, minivans and and cars with like you know big back seat do you have a big family down. no uh we have a big person what do you mean a big person <laughs> well he's got some strings on him and he's made of wood okay right, so. <laughs> it takes up a lot of room but he's really quiet <laughs> most of the time so <laughs> so okay so then you're doing this thing and you're doing your symphony thing and then you said, you know what I like to do? I'm going to do some pop music. I'm going to do something different. And then on top of that, I think, you know, I'm really sick of New York. I think I'll just move to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure yeah, it didn't happen that way, but how did that all come about? <laughs> that kind of sums it up. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, um, so as, once I was at conservatory, there was a program there uh, 
called Studio Composition. And it was musicians that were in the conservatory learning how to write pop music, like singer songwriters, mm -hmm. and also learning how to work in a recording studio. And they had a very nice recording studio. They actually had several at, at purchase while I was there. And, um, you know, everybody's always looking for a bass player. And I played electric bass. And oh, yeah, um, they are. Trust me, I've been in enough bands. Keyboard yeah. and bass players. That's what they yep. always. Yeah. And so there was a lot of really talented songwriters um, while I was in the conservatory there. And I just ended up linking up with a bunch of them to play bass. And uh, it was kind of the first time I had realized that there was an avenue outside of classical music to mm -hmm. pursue if you wanted to be a musician. Because going into school, I thought, well, my options are I could be a music teacher or I could uh, try to be a performance major right. and try to get into a <laughs> symphony. And it never really dawned on me that there was a major for songwriting or for pop music or, you know, other outlets. Um, what? So I kind of <laughs> just get, transitioned me. from there. The big, I difference up... is, big difference, in my opinion, is you get a symphony gig, you're there for life unless you screw up. Yeah. You know, you're, you've got a job for the rest of your life. You're a teacher. You, you can teach and I may obviously make more money being in the symphony. But, but yeah. the other side is if you write pop music, everybody likes, but then you can't sell anything and you got to go on tour. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely a different It's not a steady style. gig, so to speak. So, <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's a little bit of both there. But the thing about symphony, though, is it's like, it's funny, too, when you think about it. Are we going to cover that Beethoven stuff again? I mean, it's not like, you know, in pop music, it's like, we're going to do a cover. You don't hear about that in symphony. It's like, we're going to do the Ninth Symphony. We're going to do something like you said, Bach. And it's like, do you mean we're going to do covers of Bach? It's, it's <laughs> interesting you say that. I've been using this line for a long time. Uh, it felt like I was training to be in the world's oldest cover band. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's what it was. Like, there... In the classical world, they're not like really open to a lot of interpretation of mm -hmm. the music. They'll change something so ever so slightly and and that person will either be revered or as like a genius for changing the tempo by two BPM or they'll be shunned, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I remember- Sounds like uh, a song title or a, <laughs> a title of a book. I got, I got ostracized for two BPM. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, for my junior recital in school, um, me and my friend, instead of um, having a piano player accompany me for one of my pieces, we did a, um, a backing track that we built with a Fender Rhodes <clears throat> and um, drum, drum loops and stuff. And, uh, you know, my, my teacher, Tim, loved it. He thought it was brilliant. Um, because he is he was more forward thinking but I, I remember the violin and, and cello players when I went to do my jury which is where they decide if you've accomplished enough mm -hmm. to move to the next yeah I've the next that, yeah. level yeah uh they they had me turn it off after like 30 seconds they didn't want to hear it uh they were, they had me play something else um Isn't and that, that was like kind of discouraging to you that I mean you work so hard on something that people tell you it's great. And then you get in front of people and you go, Oh, okay. That's enough of that. Yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> now get your, get your bass violin, you know, get your thing out here. Let's get going. Let's go to the real yeah. stuff. Now I'm not a believer. This is just my opinion that people can learn how to write a song. They can learn the basics of how to write a song, but you have to have a skill set. I think it's a gift to be able to write a song. You know, it's kind of like I can, and you know this, because I, a friend of mine I used to play with, he's a very well-known trumpet player. I'd say, what's the difference between somebody plays in the symphony and what we do here? And he said, well, you and I, if I said to guys in the symphony, we're going to jam a one, one, four, five song in B, they'd look at us like, what? Yeah. Where's the, where's the, where's the music? <laughs> and, and he said, they can't do that but they can sight read beyond belief, you know? So the theory is there and then you understand that stuff. I do stuff and don't, you know, I understand why it works the way it works, 
but I don't sit around a concert in Detroit and go, okay, I need to do this here and all that stuff. With I think people with music theory tend to do that more because they understand it better. Do I would you, agree. You, do you agree with that? I do, yeah. And that uh, coming out of the classical world, uh, it took me a while to adapt to things like what you just said, like, all right, this is going to be like a one, four, five, and B, you know, like, uh, and a lot of a lot of that growth is is still happening, you know, like, oh, uh, sure. and and uh, he said playing playing music and writing songs, you know, not everybody can write a song. I do think um, you can practice writing songs though, and there, I, I there's a lot that. to yeah. to repetition. I know when I first started writing songs. It was with the goal of, I was in a band called Fireflies and I wanted one of my songs to be on one of the records. That was like my dream. Right. The, the <clears throat> lead writer in that band was so talented. And I said, if I could write a song that got on a record for this band, I'd be really excited. And uh, so I wrote two to three songs a day mm -hmm. um, for like years, for a couple of years. I had notebooks and notebooks full of oh, songs wow. that <clears throat> you know most of them are just gone throw yeah. away throw stuff. away yeah but uh and i probably wrote 200 songs before i released anything you know <laughs> <laughs> well that's what i tell people when i release an album i said you have no idea how many didn't get to, to make the cut i'm the one making the cut so you know you start on something and of course i record everything so I sit down and start giving an idea, and then I would start putting all the all the tracks on it, and then I get through the whole thing and go, eh, not worth it, and yeah. I might spend three or four days on it or five or a week. Um, but when you, how? All right, so you're in, you're in the upstate, you're in Albany, and all that good stuff. But, and I know you haven't been there too long in a while. How did you get there? Other than I flew there, but I mean, what was? <laughs> how, did you get a phone call, or did you call somebody, or how did that all come about? You know, I. Uh, this sound. It's going to sound like this is going to sound like a little kid's answer, but uh, <laughs> I had. I had always wanted to live on an island, and okay. uh, I thought it'd be really cool. And I had a project in New York, which actually is kind of like full circle because that's what I'm releasing based off of now, but I had a band called the Nightmare River Band. And we had been doing it for probably close to maybe 10 years at that mm. point. And it, it just felt like things were really plateaued and tapering off. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I, didn't I knew that there was it was kind of gonna be, it was gonna be a transition to the start of me releasing music under my name right. instead of a band name and if I stayed in New York I would have ended up hiring all the same musicians that were in Nightmare River Band <laughs> and playing all the same clubs and yeah. trying to get yeah. the same people to come see me play yeah only because you your name's on the band is yeah I got you yeah I just didn't I didn't think I had the energy to do that mm. and I wanted to s try to start something completely fresh with a new crowd and a, and a new backdrop you know um, and so just something about the idea of Hawaii was in my head and and I had uh, I just bought a house in upstate New York up in the Adirondacks and so I was on all these real estate mailings and I started getting real estate stuff for Hawaii just started to come into my inbox. And I was always looking at it and I saw all these prices on, on the big Island. I said, wow, man, I could really afford to live there. Uh, not realizing that those are all houses that are in the path of when the volcano goes up, the lava <laughs> like goes right through your yard, sometimes through your house. So that's why those houses are so they're so cheap. Yeah, they're affordable. And uh, but then I started doing very research. Very hot here. Very hot. Yeah, <laughs> I ended up just kind of falling in love with the idea of it, and I, I did a little more research and saw that there's a pretty vibrant music scene on Oahu. So uh, that's kind of how I ended up here. 
I think it's interesting to me that people, and I say this to young performers a lot um, and when I meet them, um, anybody that seemed to succeed in the music business has some risk they take. Now, and I always say it's not like getting in your car and drive 120 miles an hour. There's just something they do that kind of says, I'm going to be, I'm going to go out. Almost everybody I've talked to, it, and it's funny, and it, some of it seems a little silly. Like in your case, if you tell people that are conservative in nature, the way they live, they'd go like, you just moved to Hawaii? <laughs> what? Oh, I think the music scene's really good out there. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, but on the other hand, look how the difference now. Because I think the thing is you've now... You're, you're, when you showed up, yeah, you're all new, but you're kind of like the outsider coming in, but you also get two things going on, in my opinion. You get your ideas showing up to hit them and their ideas showing up to you. So it gives you two different new paths. I mean, obviously you're the new guy in town. They're going to go, who's this New York guy trying to do some stuff here, you know? But on the other hand, you're like, that song is a kahooka hooka waka hooka. What? What's the song called? <laughs> So, yeah. So, but you're exposed to both of them. So yeah. when you got there, did you, did you, what did you do? I mean, when you showed up, you said, I want to try to find a band. Do you want to find some place? I mean, obviously you had to start playing or do something to kind of do while you were there. So I, when I first got here, my thought was, I'm going to take a month and just relax and, right. and not really do much of anything. <laughs> And uh, that was my plan, but it didn't really happen. I, I actually ended up getting work immediately. I um, I like kind of walked into a restaurant and just asked if it was hard to get a bartending job on the, on the strip because I thought, you know, I could bartend a few days a week and not have to worry about whether I gig. And like, you know, I was in my bathing suit. I just come from the beach. I was drinking a beer and watching the football game and they sent a manager out and they hired me on the spot. I didn't even apply. I just asked and said, oh, I really wasn't looking to work, yet. <laughs> but I didn't want to. Uh, I said, well, this could be my opportunity. And I, so I started working almost immediately. And then I, as far as the music side went, I just kind of, it was almost a similar path. I walked into a few open mics and just introduced myself around um, and I think I went to two or three open mics that one at like all at different clubs to try to meet people. And I always made a point to introduce myself to the sound guy because that guy is work. He's there more he than knows the everybody. Mic he knows everybody. Yeah. And so, and I did a little research about you know, who was who here. And there was, a, and he's very well known actually on the mainland now. Um, but he was he was rising quick when I first got here. His name was Mike Love, uh, not from the Beach Boys. But yeah, I knew the, that. Uh, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> but the reggae uh, guy, and he does a lot with looper pedals. He's, he's a really, really talented guy. And I went in and saw him do this show where he had he sits on this big stool and he's got these dreads coming down past his waist, and he's a really good guitar player, and he's got like the looper pedals, and he's got like tiers of pedals he had to have like 30 pedals in front of him <laughs> and i thought wow this guy is really he's like a genius to be able to even just to like catalog what he's using yeah and how how he's going to trigger everything and so i talked to him after the show and just mentioned that i was a bass player from new york and um and he said what well, you know i play here every tuesday and thursday um Tuesday is what you just saw and Thursday is with my full band. Why don't you come back? I'll put you on the guest list for Thursday. You can meet my bass player. Maybe he'll have some like advice for you. Mm -hmm. And so I said, Oh, well, I was really grateful. I came back two days later. I met his bass player. He was a fantastic human being and musician. Um, and he, it was just like the right moment for me to meet him. Cause he said, you know, I'm moving back to Boston in like, two or it was like two or three months from now and all my gigs are going to be up for grabs and he was gigging very yeah all the he time he was like a big 
he was the guy in the in the scene here for bass. And I su I'm sure it's a little bit like Vegas. There's so many clubs over there. I mean, so many people playing all the time that there's yeah, a lot of music going on. Yeah, it, there's a lot of resort music. Yeah, uh, which is like you know Vegas. Yeah, like Vegas, that, yeah. So he so he said, well, do you think you could do this gig? The and that was with Mike Love, and I said, yeah. I mean, I would. In the the bass playing is pretty intense in that in that group but with you know with enough with enough lead time i could probably do it <laughs> I told him and he said well also you know there's there's going to be a gig um my i play with henry capono uh do you want to come by sunday and meet henry if he can sing harmonies you'd have a really good shot at getting that gig so i uh i knew the name henry capono because he's a legend here and um you know, he's a Grammy nominated musician. He was the first Hawaiian musician to get a major label deal uh, in the 70s with his band CMK. And they had like, uh, I forget what the name of the group is, but like Lee Sklar and all those session oh, yeah. guys playing on his first couple records. Yeah, Lee, yeah. And so I said, yeah, I'll come by. So I went by Sunday and it was, you know, all within five days I had made this incredible connection uh from being just a guy sitting in the audience at this concert i enjoyed to being on a short list of people that were maybe going to get asked to be henry capono's next bass player when when his bass player left and uh you know i i talked to him for a while we exchanged information i didn't hear from him for a little bit and i just assumed maybe he went with somebody who he had right. known yeah. for a while and then yeah. i got a call one day and he said uh you know, let's, let's grab coffee. And, uh, we, we sat and had coffee and, and he asked me if I thought I could do it, if I had the time, if I wanted to do it. And the answer was yes to all of that. And <laughs> I uh, ended up starting playing with him maybe like a month later. Uh, I took over for John. I think, the thing, though, that that I think the thing about it though, is this is you obviously are good or they wouldn't hire you. I mean, it, I mean, you, well, you, you kind of pass over a little bit. I mean, it sounds like I showed up and I talked to the guys, but you had to be able to perform because they wouldn't, they wouldn't give you, if you hadn't been able to show what you could do to a certain degree, they would have just gone, that's sure. oh, nice knowing you have a nice life. Yes. So, you know, I think that that's the key. Granted, you have to force yourself into putting yourself into positions that you don't like. You know, it's like doing an open mic night when you don't, you know, you're not, you're going someplace you never knew. And then you go, I got to, oh, I hate doing this, but I got to do it. Yeah. And, and that's the way you, you meet people. And if, and if you're any good, or, then people are going to like you. But if, and in this situation and, and uh, Henry, I was reading about him and he's got the nonprofit. I was reading about that, which was kind of an interesting, cause I used to work in the nonprofit world, but um, I'm always intrigued by people that do stuff like that and give it back to their community. It doesn't matter what they're doing. I just think it's interesting. But if they're a musician, I'm really intrigued by it because it's like, you know, everybody thinks we're egotistical and all that good stuff. I'm a lead guitar player. Of course, I am egotistical. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm the, no, I have no time for a lot of grass today. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that that's the main thing. It, it, I, to me, it sounds like, I don't know how long it was you were there before you realized I made the smart decision in my life. Here right. you are now, set your ways, you got there, you're there now, you established yourself. And I think that's that's the thing, but so you, you're playing with Henry, you're doing these gigs, but apparently that wasn't enough for you. You started yeah. writing and doing your own stuff with your own people. Is yeah. that correct? Well, you know, I spent a lot of time, I have the bass player background, but most of my time in New York City, I spent working on my solo career. So I always had people asking me to play bass for them. And I usually turn them down unless they were like a good friend who was maybe stuck and needed a bass player for a tour or like, I just wanted to focus on my thing. The opportunity with Henry was too good to pass up. Sure. And um, so I was always kind of working on both. Um, and I think just the, the solo side of things is start is starting to rise back up, uh, 
and it interests something you said in in uh, a couple minutes ago made made me think of actually the project that I'm I'm releasing now because you said like well how how did you do this how did you get these people involved and you said it was like four years of work at it and I've got that question a lot recently I have this this album Last Goodbye Eleven that I'm putting out and it's it's a essentially a reimagination of an album that I put out 11 years ago yeah. um, where I, where I got some friends of mine to uh, each reimagine a track from the original album, reproduce it, rearrange it. Mm. Um, so it's 11 new artists, each doing one track from the nightmare river bands last goodbye. And a lot of people have asked me, how did you get these people to do this? Because a lot of them are, are pretty big names in the indie music world. And uh, it was just, you know, 18 years of touring. These were, <laughs> it's, these weren't cold calls. They're all friends. You know, they're people that we traded shows with and slept on couches. And like, you know, they all eat just eat people I have a bond with from sure. years of playing yeah. music. And that wouldn't have happened if I, without years of working yeah. at it and um no it does i mean it, it, there, and really that's a trust thing <clears throat> there's two things they know they know a that you're a good player and b they can trust you when i got the music or the stuff that i was sent to listen to i noticed there was other people performing on it you weren't singing yeah i i only i played upright bass on one track and one of them, I, and I have to go back and listen to it, and, I'll, and if you shoot me an email with your email on it, there, I'll send it to you. It was one with a woman singing, I think, on that I was really taken by. I can't remember the same, I can't remember, can't remember this song now. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, this is, this is the guy's not singing on this. And, <laughs> and that, so that explains it to me, what you've done, where you've taught these people in. And that's got to be going back to what you said the songs that are on there did you write all of them i wrote everything that's there yeah okay so it's got to be fun to give it to people to have them say okay here's you do something with it it was when you're sitting there i'm sitting i'm sure you're going like well, i never thought about that it it was so rewarding to be honest uh, i knew everybody i asked to be on it how talented they were yeah. they've all had ver various levels of success but they've all been successful uh and and the the talent the amount of talent that that collective group of people have is is overwhelming um and i remember you know i would get they kind of trickled in over a year and a half the like recordings can i ask how long it took you to do it yeah yeah i started it during the kind of the COVID lockdowns. Were I, you I, there when you started it? Did they come there to? Record? I was here, so which much? is why I decided not to perform on anything. I, I, uh, uh, Henry had put out a record called "The Songs of C and K," where he had a younger generation reimagine some of the C and K hits mm -hmm. that he had had, and uh, he kind of he participated in all the recordings he sang on a lot of them, and um, and I was thinking like, oh, you know, like the 10 year anniversary for Last Goodbye is coming up. I could do something like that. I have like a really great group of people that would probably be interested in being involved. And um, so we were gonna release Last Goodbye 10 and uh, took a little longer. So it's Last Goodbye almost 12 really, because it <laughs> turns 12 in August, but I squeezed it in under 11. I, th I thought it sounded nicer. There was 11 tracks. And, uh, but yeah, when I, when they all started to trickle in, you listen to it and you say, wow, that's like really something. How come I didn't think of that? <laughs> or like, I, or, you know, just like the, the amount of smiling I did listening to the tracks that they oh, came yeah. out. Just, uh, you know, my secret agenda was if I get all these people, these successful friends of mine to, to uh, cut tracks of my music, maybe a publisher would be interested in what I do. Uh, and, you know, that 
and it seems like there might be some interest in that, which is cool. exciting. But uh, so my question, of course, is when you get this done, what are you gonna do with it? Well, my I mean, you're not going to go on a tour, so <laughs> my my desire for that kind of thing is is mostly so that I can write music that gets pitched to other people and uh and gets cut by other artists and uh i was just at a songwriting festival over on on the big island and um i was talking with one of the mentors and uh i you know who's had a lot of songs cut by various artists and i just he said what well, he said he thought it was a great idea and i said yeah like i've been trying so hard to get my music cut by other people that I never even thought to just ask somebody to play one of my songs. And I did. And it worked out that I got 11 different people to wow. do my songs. And, you know, uh, I, th I think, I don't know how much I would want to be on the road anymore. I, I like, I like my home life. If the right opportunity came up, I would go out. The industry has changed so much where these famous people have a crowd of a group of people writing a song for them instead of, it's like writing a movie. You know, it's like they sit down, let's get all this, or a TV series, let's get a bunch of writers in there and start doing it. You know, and I think it, in my opinion, it loses that, um, that feel for reality. The sincerity is gone. It, a is the sincerity is gone because it's like, what word should we use here? Oh, let's not get this, the SARS out. Now, I may do that, but I'm not going to do it forever the word. Right. You know? And so uh, it's, it's the thing about music, and you know this, it's a consumable product. Most people don't think of it that way, but it really is. And we talked earlier about symphony. Look, if Beethoven could stand up now, or Mozart, and we'd say, hey, do you know we're still playing your music like 250 years later? They'd all go like, no way. I mean, <laughs> no way. And I had a conversation with the people when we talked about Hendrix. He died 54 years ago. People still playing. They're still going yeah. on tour listening to it. You know, well, and if Beethoven made it now, one of the A&R guys would say, where's the hook? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, hey, that da, 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 da. I don't think that's a very good hook. <laughs> that's not going to do it. <laughs> that's exactly what they would say. Was, yeah. Where's the hook? That, uh, that's funny. I like that. That's funny. <laughs> So you're, are you finished with the project? Yeah, actually, the, believe it or not, uh, the single was released today. Uh, Which single was it? What was the name of it? So it's called Oh Me Oh My, and it was cut by the, uh, the group Panama Wedding based out of New York. Um, Panama Wedding is, is more or less the vision of Peter Kirk, the songwriter from that group, and it, he was a, a good friend of mine from back from college. Uh, we were we were paired together freshman year uh, to sing sight singing and dictation in solfege class. You know where you use all the syllables mm. the do re mi fa sol la si do to sing to sight read essentially music, and we would have to sing together three times a week. Uh, Bach chorales at like 8 a.m. And we we're, oh, well, I don't want to say, I don't want to include him in this, but we weren't very good as a, as a duo. Uh, and I think the teacher always made us, he always made sure to find us, you know, no matter where we sat. You, you guys stand up and you on. have to conduct and sing, and yeah. it was brutal. <laughs> well, but you haven't forgotten it, and that, and it, it probably taught you a little bit. I Talk could probably go back and do it a lot better now after, <laughs> you know, practical, practical applications of it. Well, yeah, in that's, the real it, that's world. the other thing. So in your situation there on the, on the island, are you popular? Do people come to you? Do you perform there? Do you go out and perform very much? Yeah. So I, um, I have a residency at like a small tiki bar called Arnold's where I play every Thursday and every other Friday. Uh, and then I do a ton of gigs with with henry on bass and i do quite you know i've had various residencies at other clubs and, and stuff like that i i'm a uh, part of this 
program that the Henry Capone Foundation does called the On the Rise program, where they're like getting more meaningful gigs to kind of like elevate songwriters they believe in out of like the bar room so that they can be playing. Yeah. So I did a, th a theater gig recently through that, playing uh, the Manoa Valley Theater. And I played the Blue Note a couple times through that opening mm. for various kind of Hawaiian. I opened for Henry one, uh, on one of them and Keola Beamer, who's another really well-known island musician. And um, and then I, I play, yeah, I play quite a bit. I end up playing like four to five times a week. And um, when I when I promote a show, it, it's, they're crowded. It's just that when you play somewhere every week, it's just people know you're there and they come oh sure their, yeah that kind yeah. of thing but uh yeah I'll, I'll do i've gotten quite a few opening slots for pretty big island musicians i opened up for frank turner when he was in town and um the silver sun pickups when they were in town and some other big indie groups and yeah yeah so you know never where i want to be but always moving forward you know <laughs> hey brother it's been a pleasure yeah thank thank you so much Rick. Just hold